Hello and good morning, everybody, or better, good afternoon in your country. My name is Joachim Pieprek, and I would first like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about physics and simulation of gallium nitride-based light emitters. And this is, of course, a very broad topic, way too broad to fit into a one-hour lecture. And that is why I will focus on some lessons I have learned in more than 20 years of research in this field. And I will also try to focus on some of the remaining problems, in particular in the first part, uh, when it comes to material properties, there are still a number of properties we struggle with in this material system, and I will briefly point that out. And um, the following parts of my talk will address different light emitting device types. First, the light emitting diode, LED, and here we have the widely discussed phenomenon of efficiency droop, and I will explain what that is and why we are still dealing with this problem. Then uh, in the area of laser diodes, I will address the uh, problems we have with the whole conductivity, the poor whole conductivity uh, and the polarization field in quantum worlds. And the third device type is a more recent development, superluminescent diode, SLD. And here we also have efficiency issues, which uh, I was able to track down to the problem of Auger recombination. And I will talk about that as well. And in the end, in summary, I will uh, give some recommendations about uh, the simulation strategy that uh, I suggest for a su successful simulation project. And these strategies, I think, are applicable to all kinds of simulation projects, not just um, in gallium nitride devices. And if you are interested, in a more fundamental introduction into the field, then I can recommend uh, some of these books. The first book that I wrote almost 20 years ago is a general introduction into semiconductor optoelectronic device simulation, modeling and simulation. So the relatively simple explanations, I would think. The next book then focused on the high-end examples, and I served as an editor here to collect uh, the work of uh, leading experts in the field from all over the world. And there's also some example on gallium nitride LEDs in there. And the third book was then completely focused on nitride devices, because at that time it became clear that there are some fundamental issues with these popular, popular devices, fundamental bottlenecks that need attention from the modeling and theoretical uh, communities. And so I collected contributions from many experts from all over the world in this field. And finally, the most recent handbook of optoelectronic device modeling and simulation also includes some examples uh, and some chapters about new materials, which are uh, obviously of great interest at this uh, workshop here. And first, some fundamentals on the nitride material properties. Uh, this material is uh, popular because for in optoelectronics because it can cover a wide range of wavelengths because by mixing uh, indium into gallium nitride, we can cover basically the whole visible range of in the spectrum. Uh, it started in the, in the near ultraviolet in the early years and moved into the blue, which is pretty much established now and uh, currently moving into the green domain. Red is uh, still a little, little bit off limit. I think the other materials are used for for red light uh, in, in many applications. But what I see increasingly in the literature now is the other direction that people uh, uh, mix in aluminum and go deeper into the ultraviolet 
uh, region uh, where there are also a number of applications. And there are uh, also uh, other properties that are of interest for non-optical applications like high electron velocity, high breakdown field, high thermal conductivity, and chemical and mechanically uh, advantageous properties. And one of the most important property was acceptor doping. Uh, and that was the reason that for a long time we didn't have any gallium nitride based PN junctions because the P doping was especially difficult. Uh, only in the uh, 90s, some researchers in Japan discovered how to make that happen. Uh, and they eventually received the Nobel Prize in physics for that work. And in particular, uh, still today, we use mainly magnesium as an acceptor, but magnesium has a large activation energy, 10 times larger than typical acceptors in semiconductors. And that means only a small part of these magnesium atoms are actually ionized at room temperature. So if we want 10 to the 18 uh, uh, per cube centimeter hole density in our p dot layer, then we need uh, 100 times more magnesium atoms. And that strong doping uh, causes a lot of scattering. And that means that the whole mobility is uh, quite low. And actually, practical values are well below this number, maybe one or two orders of magnitude below that number. So the poor Whole conductivity is a, still a serious problem with uh, all applications of, of, uh, of these devices. And uh, this uh, poor whole conductivity causes high bias, high voltage, and energy loss and heat. And I will talk about this later in more detail. Another problem is the built-in polarization. So the hexagonal crystal structure uh, implies a built-in field, even without strain. So we have a so-called spontaneous polarization of these materials that cause a, a fixed interface charge at all hetero interfaces. And on top of this, we also have strain-induced polarization. So when, you, when we grow quantum worlds in particular here, then the, the uh, built-in carriers, uh, fixed charges at these interfaces, create a strong internal field in the quantum world. And that internal field separates electrons and holes from each other. And that means that we have uh, less probability of transitions, less light coming out of these uh, quantum worlds. And that's why in most cases, these quantum worlds have to be very thin, a few nanometers thin. But uh, later on, I will show you that uh, even thick quantum worlds can work very well. That is some recent discovery uh, that I will report. And uh, yeah, the third uh, problem I want to point out, and that will show up in, in all the device uh, uh, examples that I will talk about later, is Auger recombination. Auger recombination is a non radiative recombination process between electrons and holes in which the energy. Uh, that has to go somewhere is given to another electron and that electron jumps higher up into the conduction band or can also happen in the valence band. And um, traditionally, this Auger recombination has always been a problem in many optoelectronic applications uh, in the telecom region, for instance, it was one of the dominating loss processes. But with increasing band gap in the nitrides, uh, physicists always thought that problem will go away because the uh, probability of such transition uh, goes down exponentially with larger band gap. So the Auger coefficient should drop dramatically. But what was measured in the nitrides was several orders of magnitude stronger Auger recombination. And, uh, but one must say the measurement uh, is always tricky. It's not possible to directly measure the, the C parameter. There were always indirect methods and which uh, have a number of uncertainties. And that's why the published values of the C parameter still vary uh, almost by two orders of magnitude. And on the theoretical side, we also don't have clarity yet, even after 20 years, 
uh, what kind of process is going on in these nitride devices. So uh, some researchers say that is a direct Auger recombination that I mentioned, and others think that uh, the dominating process is an indirect Auger recombination in which a third particle is involved, for instance, a phonon, uh, to uh, uh, enable that kind of transition. So there is still a lot of uncertainty about this very important loss process. And now I want to uh, start talking about different device types. And I have used these pictures from a uh, uh, talk of Nikolai Matoshek at our NUSOT conference a few years back. He showed very nicely the difference between these types. So first of all, we have LEDs in which uh, photons are generated spontaneously in the active region and then travel in all directions. And some of them, and hopefully most of them, get out and create light. There is no gain. There is no cavity effect in these LEDs. So I will talk about this first. And then we have laser diodes in which we use waveguides to capture the photons, some of the photons, so that they travel along the active region and generate more photons. And we also put a, a, a facet, a reflectant, reflective facets on both ends so that we have an optical cavity and the photons are sent back and forth many times to form a strong laser beam in the end. And uh, this uh, beam is mainly made out of stimulating emission photons, so photons that are generated uh, by other photons that trigger that uh, transition. And uh, more recently, attention shifted uh, to a, a third part of a, a device, third type of device that is the so-called luminescent, superluminescent diode. And, and that is very similar to the laser diode. It also uses a waveguide, but it removes the reflectance on one or both facets. That's why we have these angled waveguides. And what happens then is that the, the photons that are generated by, by spontaneously emitted photons along the way to the facet, they don't go back. They just go out of that facet. And we, talk, we call it amplified spontaneous emission. And this kind of device has some uh, exciting uh, properties and advantageous properties, um, especially for augmented reality devices and other things. So, and in all of these cases, uh, energy efficiency is uh, really the main topic, uh, and that drives the whole development of gallium nitride based light emitters. We want to save energy. So what is the energy efficiency? Uh, sometimes it's called power conversion efficiency in the case of lasers. In the case of LEDs, it's often called wall plug efficiency. But it's always the same thing. Very simply, it divides the optical output power, energy per second, this power, by the electrical input power. And uh, so that means that the output power is divided by current times voltage. And we can split up this formula into several contributions. First, we can extract here the energy of a photon divided by the energy of an electron. And what remains is a quantum efficiency. So in this, here we only count the number of particles, the number of photons, the number of electrons. So this is the ratio of these two particles. And that can further be split up into the internal quantum efficiency, which gives us the number of photons per uh, injected electrons that are generated inside the chip, inside the device. But not all of these photons are able to leave the device. So we have to multiply with a light extraction efficiency that gives us the ratio of uh, photons that are able to leave the semiconductor chip. And I, my work is mainly based on simulations. And I typically use uh, uh, software APSIS or PIX3D by Crosslight software. And this software has the advantage that it combines all relevant processes as that go on in an optoelectronic device. 
self consistently. That means all these processes talk to each other in the process of the simulation, like in a real device. And this way we can simulate the actual performance of a device. And in particular, we need to combine an electronic model drift diffusion for the current flow, then a model for the photon emission from strained quantum wells that we have in most devices, then an optical model that uh, describes the internal propagation of these photons and the light extraction, and a heat flux model to calculate the temperature increase that always happens in all these devices. And self-consistency means that the increasing temperature will then change material parameters in all these other uh, components. For instance, it will change the mobility, it will change the optical gain, it will change the uh, refractive index. So, And that, that way we can uh, achieve a self-consistent, realistic simulation of optoelectronic devices. And you can imagine this kind of software uh, combines many years of work. It's hard to do in a single PhD project. That's why we mainly use uh, commercial software in this field. It's not just Crosslight, there are other software packages on the market, but I am using this Crosslight software. So, what are the LED applications? That's a simple question because we all see LEDs every day in our life, starting from traffic lights, then to uh, outdoor displays, full color displays, and and other and 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 white light sources. And these white light sources typically only need a, a blue LED. That then by using phosphors, ye yellow is added. Uh, and that creates a white light impression. But we increasingly also see uh, green LEDs based on gallium nitrides. As I mentioned in the beginning, the red is mainly from other materials. So there are countless applications. But in all these applications, we are still dealing with a, a mysterious phenomenon, the so-called efficiency droop. What is efficiency droop? So normally when we send in more electrons, we expect to get a linear increase of photons that come out. So LED power should go linear with the, in, with the current. But that is not what we measure. We measure a sublinear behavior and that uh, when we divide output power by input power, we get the wall plug efficiency. And this efficiency then shows a decline and a droop. So that is the so-called efficiency droop. Without efficiency droop, we would expect uh, increasing almost 100% efficiency. But in reality, that droop goes down dramatically, uh, even more than I show in this picture. And that is, of course, a, a, a huge problem, uh, not only a scientific problem, but also a commercial problem for the solid state lighting industry. And, uh, I will talk about this later in more detail. So here is a little bit of physics behind this droop phenomenon. It all goes into the internal quantum efficiency that I mentioned before. And that counts the number of photons that we get out uh, divided by the number of electrons that we send in, the photons that come out of the active layer. So we send in current from both sides, whole current and electron current. And inside the active layer, there are different processes happening. There is, of course, radiative recombination, and that generates the light, that generates photons. That's what we want. But there are also non-radiative processes, like Shockley-Reid-Hall recombination via defects, and that generates phonons or heat. And then Auger recombination that I already mentioned, that generates hot carriers, but eventually also heat. And then there is a third process that is leakage, meaning that electrons jump out of the active layer and recombine with holes uh, in the p-doped layers outside the active layer. And uh, a, a typical simple model for these processes is the so-called ABC or ABCD model that simply divides the radiative current by the total current and the current is given by the recombination rate 
for radiative recombination, it goes with the square of the carrier density and divided by the total current. And of course, leakage is hard to describe. Some people use this. I don't prefer this uh, way of doing leakage uh, calculations, but, but that is what you see in some papers. So, and the big struggle or debate that uh, developed in this field is the question, which process dominates the group? And there are, is one group of people who think Auger recombination is the main cause of the efficiency group. And that is, that started with a paper published in 2007 by a group from Philips Luminet and they did uh, measurements of the internal quantum efficiency over excitation density. That was a photoluminescent measurement. Uh, and they uh, then measured this peak efficiency and uh, a decline, a droop of the efficiency at higher density. And they used uh, this simple ABC model to fit the curve and, and realize that, okay, it, it must be the Auger recombination. It was not a direct evidence, but it was a suggestion, an idea, a good idea. And on the other hand, almost in parallel, we published a, another theory. So I was collaborating with uh, some researchers from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and from uh, Korea. And um, I was able to reproduce their measurements, uh, assuming that electrons leak out of the quantum well. So I could reproduce this measurement by introducing some leakage mechanism into the model. And that was at the time uh, also an accepted uh, model. And, but both approaches are based on modeling. So you, you cannot measure this directly. In both cases, these IQE curves are reproduced by models, but the models make different assumptions and therefore end up with different conclusions. And in both cases, we have very serious modeling uncertainties. And that is uh, one of the most important uh, lessons I learned in my career that with modeling, you can never be certain that you make the correct assumptions and draw the correct conclusions. And uh, in case of Auger, of the Auger model, uh, there are at least two uncertainties. First of all, the parameters A, B, C that are extracted from such a measurement depend on the carrier density inside the active layer. And you normally don't know that carrier density. Some people measure this and that's a good approach. And then you can nail it down. Every uh, vertical combination of A, B and C will give exactly the same uh, IQE curve. That is one uncertainty. And the second uncertainty is actually the IQE itself, the, the efficiency, internal quantum efficiency is not known because what we can measure is always the external quantum efficiency, but then we have to divide this by the light extraction efficiency. And that is always an estimated number, the light extraction efficiency. So in the end, we can never say exactly what the internal quantum efficiency is. We can say what is the uh, current density at which we observe that peak efficiency, but we don't know the peak efficiency itself. So that, that is another big uncertainty in the simple ABC approach. Then on the other hand, we have the leakage model that is based on more elaborate numerical simulations. And here we run into other problems, for instance, this electron blocker layer that is supposed to stop or reduce electron leakage has certain material properties that are not exactly known. In particular, the, the polarization field that also happens inside this layer is not exactly known. As a theory always gives a somewhat larger field than it is measured um, in, in these devices. So there we have to apply some scaling factor to reduce the theoretical prediction. And depending on that scaling factor, we can reduce the electron leakage from almost 100% to 
of the injection current to almost nothing just by varying that scaling factor and that's a totally arbitrary factor. And another uh, uh, problem is the conduction band offset between different materials. We always have a different uh, difference in band gap. And the question is how much of that difference goes into a conduction band. If we say 50%, then we have a lot of leakage. If we say 65%, uh, uh, then we have no leakage. So it's just, and this number is also not exactly known. So uh, such a little variation of that number can make a, di a huge difference. So how can we distinguish between these models and make a decision? So, and I investigated that uh, troubled me for a long time. Yeah, in the beginning, I started in the leakage camp, but then more and more I questioned my own finding and, and, and investigated some more what we can do about it. And in this paper, I think one of my most important papers, because it, it tries to answer that question, I show that even in, in my own modeling, I can explain the measurements, the dots, the measured efficiency and the measured bias by both theories. If, if I want to favor the electron leakage theory, then I use a small acceptor density in the uh, uh, electron blocker layer and a small Auger coefficient, and I get almost perfect agreement. If I want to favor the Auger theory, then I use a large acceptor density and uh, also a large Auger coefficient get almost the same agreement. Yeah, this acceptor density in argon layers is another great uncertainty because only a small fraction of the magnesium atoms turns into acceptors. And we don't know what that fraction is, so we don't really know what is the acceptor density in the electron blocking layer. And the simple answer, or the answer I found in this paper is we need more measurements. So this cannot be solved by modeling this problem. And uh, so, uh, and I uh, propose that people should measure the efficiency at different temperatures. And because then I observed that most measurements contradict the leakage model. The, 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 the efficiency change with higher temperature uh, is measured in opposite direction than the leakage model would predict. That's also a, a kind of complicated physics behind it, but uh, I was able to explain this. So, and I had to conclude that leakage is not the dominating cause of droop uh, after all these years. So eventually sometimes you have to be able to uh, withdraw your initial theory and say that uh, it's not the dominating cause. So what can we do about it? And one option is the introduction of tunnel junctions. And I will explain a little bit. So uh, a typical LED has a number of quantum welds, in this case, eight quantum welds and covered by an electron blocking layer. And um, when we now introduce a tunnel junction into this active layer, so it's split up into four, a set of four quantum worlds, two sets of four quantum worlds, then we force, then every electron that goes in can generate uh, one photon in the first set, then it tunnels, then becomes a hole, tunnels through the tunnel junction, becomes another electron and generates a second photon. So Theoretically, every electron can generate two photons. So we can have a quantum efficiency of 200% if we do that. that. That is theory. Of course, there is a downside of that idea because we also have to apply as double the voltage. So in the end, we cannot generate energy out of nothing. The wall plug efficiency is still not much higher. And we can drive that to an extreme and uh, uh, use three tunnel junctions and four sets of two quantum worlds and have a, a even higher a quantum efficiency. And, um, the pre and I, I simulated these uh, examples and I discovered that the actual improvement that we do see in the wall plug efficiency uh, is caused by, by another effect, and which is the occupation of quantum worlds by electrons and holes. So in a practical LED, we see only uh, the top quantum world generating light, 
But when we split this up, we eventually we force all quantum wells to generate light, and that improves the wall plug efficiency. And the results were published in this paper here, and uh, I was able to demonstrate by simulation that the tunnel junction, the triple junction LED, uh, gives double the wall plug efficiency of the conventional LED and even outperforms the double heterostructure LED that some people have been suggesting. And I know today there are several groups that try to uh, fabricate such tunnel junctions, but it is difficult with a, a traditional uh, gross process. Um, and I will uh, tell you a little bit more about that later. Let's talk about another type of gallium nitride based light emitter, which is laser diodes. And these laser diodes are based on stimulated emission of photons. That means the photons are traveling inside a waveguide structure back and forth between two reflecting facets and are able to stimulate the emission of more photons and eventually leave the diode uh, in that laser beam. And there are many applications around for gallium nitride based lasers, not as many as for LEDs, but some uh, of you may have seen, uh, um, at least on TVs, these laser light shows uh, or uh, high-end cars now employ laser diodes in their uh, light beams for long distance light. And um, I got involved in the gallium nitride laser business actually when I met Suchi Nakamura uh, at a conference. We sat next to each other by accident actually at the conference dinner and uh, started to talk and, and, and uh, I congratulated him on his recent success with a high power blue laser diode and, and, and told him what I am doing. But I said, probably you don't need any simulation because your lasers are the best in the world anyway. But he said, uh, no, no, no. Um, my customers want better lasers. They want double the output power and I don't know how to do this. And the customers he was talking about were mainly people or companies working in the high definition uh, DVD field to make these, uh, for instance, a Blu-ray disc player that some of you may have heard of. And they need uh, a certain output power. And at that time, uh, the output power was not high enough. So I got started with some simulations. I simulated his laser at that time. The highest output power was 400 milliwatts. So I succeeded in reproducing his measurement, the uh, power over current and the bias over current by uh, simulating the, the optical field. This is a vertical uh, profile of the refractive index and uh, uh, optical mode inside the laser. And uh, it is very hard to compare with measurements whether to find out whether your index model is correct. So I always compare with far field measurements that are more easily done for laser diodes. And uh, these measurements are, are shown here. So in vertical direction, we had a like a, a 30 degree far field, which was in good agreement with what with my simulation. So that tells me that the a refractive index model was pretty close to reality. But then the lateral field of far field measured was wider than the one uh, that came out of my simulation. And I was really puzzled by this because the lateral far field is given by the width of the uh, ridge, uh, the lasing ridge. And in, this, in his papers, it was listed as two micrometers. So uh, eventually I was able to ask him about it. And he said, oh, two microns is just an estimate that may be larger, maybe smaller. Sometimes the, the ridge is wider on one end than on the other. So, and I was very relieved because now I could uh, change that number a little bit and, and reproduce uh, uh, the measured far field. So why I, am I tall, uh, uh, talking about this? Simple reason is 
that I learned throughout my career, it's very important to be in contact with the people who make these devices. If you want to reproduce measurements, there are always unpublished facts or, or, or issues that, that are important to know in a simulation and, and if you want to validate your model and reproduce measurements. Uh, years later, I uh, got back into the laser simulation business uh, when I saw this paper from the Panasonic Corporation about the a high power laser diode. At that time, that was the highest output power uh, from a gallium nitride based laser, 7.2 watt. But what puzzled me is that the the efficiency, the wall plug efficiency was still below 40%. So they, they already reached a record thermal resistance, record low thermal resistance by putting a heatsink on both sides of the laser. They achieved a record low optical loss by uh, changing the waveguide structure and still the efficiency was below 40% at a time when LEDs reached uh, almost double that number. So uh, I tried to simulate and, and solve that mystery. Uh, and again, uh, here you see the refractive index profile and the optical wave profile. And I also included the free carrier absorption, which pretty much uh, reproduced what they had measured, the, uh, the total absorption number. And I also reproduced the measured power, output power. And the surprising thing I discovered in these simulations is when, when what you normally expect in a laser diode, what most textbooks tell you, is that in a laser, the carrier density inside the quantum worlds stays constant above laser threshold. As soon as lasing starts, every additional electron turns into a photon. So you, so you, you have no increase in carrier density. But that is not true when the laser gets hot and these lasers get very hot. And so the hotter the laser is, the lower is the gain, the optical gain, and that requires more carriers in the active layer to maintain the threshold gain. So that's why we have a strongly rising carrier density in these lasers. And that means that also the Auger recombination keeps rising uh, with higher current and uh, this is a logarithmic scale, and you can see the Auger recombination is the strongest current loss in this analysis, by far strongest, stronger than the electron leakage, and that eventually eats away the electrons that are supposed to generate photons. So you have a decline in uh, output power, and eventually a roll off of the output power. So that result, somehow surprising result, was published in 2017. But that is not the end of the so I also investigated the bias versus current measurement. And in the simulation, you can identify the different components that uh, create this uh, high bias in these laser diodes. The basic component is the photon energy. So the minimum bias required for the uh, photon to be emitted. And uh, on top of this, you have bias created by interfaces, by contacts, and by the substrate, and most of all, by the p algon cladding layer. I mentioned before that the conductivity of uh, p-dope layers is very low, so they create a large resistance, a large bias drop in these devices, and that is reflected in this analysis. And in laser diodes, you do need these cladding layers on top of your waveguide and LEDs, you don't need it. That's why LEDs don't have that problem. And this additional excess bias that is uh, typical for these laser diodes is actually a, a stronger problem than the Auger recombination I mentioned before. And that is shown here in the, uh, when, when I plot the power fraction uh, of these that uh, consumed by these different mechanisms. So the, the lasing power consumes only a small part. This is a blue region, and, and it's in agreement with the measured uh, uh, PCE, the efficiency. The absorption cons consumes a little bit, carrier leakage cons consumes a little bit, then losses inside the quantum world, mainly Auger recombination, also consume 
uh, uh, power and, and it is increasing only at very high current. But even at low current, you see that the serious resistance, the joule heat uh, generated by the serious resistance is uh, almost the largest uh, power loss and eventually consumes uh, almost 50% of the power that you put into this kind of laser. So this cladding resistance is really the main problem and the main reason for the low efficiency of these lasers. And here is a, a short preview of my current research project in collaboration with a group from Poland. And uh, this group succeeded in uh, developing a new growth method for gallium nitride based devices in which they are able to grow multiple active regions with tunnel junctions in between. So in this case, there are two active regions with one tunnel junction, but they have grown more than that. Uh, there are already a number of papers in the literature. And here you, saw, you see the band diagram. So the electrons come in, uh, generate a photon, and then can be recycled as another electron generate another photon. So and for the first time, uh, this concept has been fabricated in a way that we actually see a quantum efficiency above 100%. In this case, it is a differential quantum efficiency. So that is a efficiency above threshold and it's barely above 100%, but nevertheless, it's 104%. And I was able to simulate this laser and, and show that uh, uh, that uh, the, when, when we would have lower losses, the losses, internal losses are a big problem. When we would have losses as low as with a Panasonic la laser, we would have 168% quantum efficiency. But uh, what uh, intrigued me most in this laser is actually something different. It is the fact that they use 25 nanometer thick quantum worlds, which was uh, unheard of before a few years earlier because of this uh, strong built-in polarization field which uh, separates electrons and holes and it, it does so also in this laser you see uh, the, the ground level electrons and holes are, are far separated but what happens is that there are so many electrons and holes in this ground level that they screen the interface charges the fixed charges at the interface the polarization charges so that means that the, the, the screen these charges and the field, the built-in field, disappears in the center of the quantum well. So we can have a second level, a uh, second quantum level, in which a lot of electrons and holes accumulate and they generate the laser light then. And, and so this is a very exciting concept. And uh, my paper was uh, accepted at the NUSA 2021 conference. and. Uh, if you are interested, you can uh, uh, att attend that conference. I will give you some info about that at the end. So the last device I would like to talk about is a superluminescent diode, which is very similar to a laser diode. Uh, it is practically a laser diode operated below th lasing threshold by removing the reflection at one or both facets. That means we cannot, uh, the, the optical uh, emission loss is very large and it cannot reach lasing. So you can drive the current uh, pretty high and uh, you get uh, photons uh, that are generated in, in one run of the, of the initial photons and, and are called amplified spontaneous emission photons. And these devices are of great interest in many applications in the medical field. Uh, here are some pictures. Of, uh, and also uh, in more and more in displays, like in augmented reality displays, where additional information is uh, projected on top of the normal visual uh, information that you see, maybe through these glasses or in airplanes, or some people even imagined uh, the uh, micro projectors uh, integrated into your phone. And I want to explain the, the superluminescence concept a little bit more. Uh, so when you have very low current, 
then your optical gain in these devices is, is negative, but you always have spontaneous emission. Yeah, and then when you reach uh, a positive gain by sending in more current, you still have the dominating sp uh, spontaneous emission. And when you then overcome the internal loss, then you have you enter the regime of superluminescence because from then on the number of photons increases in in your in your device. So when you put more and more current in. And only at the lasing threshold, when you overcome the losses at the facet uh, by the losses from uh, photons emitted from the device, then you reach lasing and uh, uh, the gain clamps, uh, stays constant. But if you set one of the reflectan reflectance zero, then that keeps rising and rising and rising and you can extend the superluminescent region uh, pretty far out. But what you need is a ref facet reflectivity below 10 to the minus 6. So this is one of the main problems with these devices that you never go down to zero facet reflectivity. So eventually at some uh, current level, you, you, the device starts to laze and then it's over for your superluminescent regime. And the fundamental problem with these devices is they have an even lower efficiency than laser diodes. So, so far the reports uh, show less than 10%, far less than 10% uh, power efficiency. And I was interested to find out why that is. And here, uh, my approach to this problem was to use the same laser simulation that I uh, explained before for the, the Panasonic laser and simply remove the reflect the uh, reflectance from one of the facets. So in a high power laser, reflectivity is very low on one facet anyway. So I simply set that to zero and, and ran the simulation again. And uh, you see the, the bias is almost the same because the layer structure is the same. The solid line is now the S-LED. The dashed line was the laser simulation. The dots are the laser measurements. But when you look at the power, simulated, then suddenly the power drops dramatically in these in the superluminescence uh, domain. Um, the temperature is not that much different. It's a little bit higher because we have less output power, more power stays inside. So we have a little bit more heating. If you have uh, less output power, that means part of the efficiency equation has changed dramatically in this case. And so we can split up the uh, efficiency again and the uh, three different components. The electrical efficiency has not changed much because it's the same layer structure, the same bias. The photon extraction efficiency is a little bit different, but still pretty high. So that can also not be the problem. But the internal quantum efficiency has changed dramatically. So it's much lower with the athlet than with the laser diode. And the resulting wall plug efficiency correspondingly is also much lower than with the laser diode. And why is that? And uh, to find out, we can now look at the different current components that go into the internal quantum efficiency. Again, the solid line is a S-LED, the dashed line is a laser. And we see immediately that the Auger recombination in these S-LEDs is much higher than in the laser, almost an order of magnitude higher. And the stimulated emission power is or current that goes into simulated emission is now much lower. So Auger recombination actually consumes more current than the uh, light generation. The all other contributions are, uh, are well below on this logarithmic scale. And so what is the reason? Again, we run into the same problem. Auger recombination uh, grows with the third power of the carrier density. So we have to look at the carrier density and the laser diode. It is increasing with increasing current because of the self-heating of the laser diode. But in the S-LED, it increases much more because the S-LED never reaches the lasing threshold. That means below threshold, the care density always increases when we send in more current. So that is true for the S-LED. 
in without the heating, the athlete carry density would still increase, but in the laser diet, it would stay flat above threshold. So that is the main problem for the athletes that the carrier density is not clamped as in the laser diet, and that's why the Auger recombination losses are much stronger than what we would see in the laser diet. And in this simulation, I have also uh, uh, explored uh, what other things we can do uh, to improve that pretty poor wall plug efficiency. So if we remove the contact resistance or optimize it, we can go up to 20% or improve the heat sinking. It's almost 19%. Or if we reduce the absorption, we get a little bit more efficiency, but it's not much better than what we already have on peak efficiency of 15% in the simulation. And uh, we can also change the design of the athlete. When we increase the cavity length, we get more when we put in more quantum worlds or when we use wider quantum worlds. That will all improve the wall plug efficiency, but never reach the efficiency demonstrated with laser diodes because of that Auger problem. In summary, I would like to point out that there is still work to be done in the field of gallium nitride based light emitters. They need significant improvements in some arenas, especially when it comes to the efficiency. And this efficiency, as I've shown, is often limited by uh, built-in material properties and not so much by the design. So we, a part of the problem is to look for optimized materials or, or alternative materials. And uh, in summary of all the simulation projects I described um, in my presentation, I want to offer a six-step simulation strategy that I think will also apply to other device simulation projects uh, outside the gallium nitride domain. So what I recommend is to first uh, think about, before you even touch the computer, think about all the possible physical processes that have an influence on, on your device performance uh, from textbooks or from the literature. And only then you are able to select the appropriate modeling approach that includes the most relevant processes. Uh, together, all together in one in one uh, uh, approach or in one simulation, and uh, then you look when you have these formulas or equations, they all include parameters, material parameters. So it's important to uh, evaluate and calibrate these material parameters uh, so that uh, your simulations uh, deliver a realistic output, and that can be demonstrated by finding agreement with relevant measurements. So you often have to go back and forth as I do, uh, I did and do, yeah, uh, between measurement and, and the initial steps uh, until you really have agreement with all the measurements you uh, uh, want to uh, study. And when you have this agreement, then you have a good basis with your simulation to analyze and understand the internal physics quantitatively and identify the key processes that limit your device performance. And after you have done that, it's probably very easy to optimize the device design and, and uh, find out how to uh, reduce these uh, uh, unwanted processes and then to predict the performance of uh, optimized device structures. So if you are interested in uh, more details of these research projects that I mentioned, you're welcome to visit the NUSORT website. And when you go to services and publications, you see a long list of papers and you can download most of these papers as PDF files. And in particular, the uh, last example, uh, the superluminescent diodes are uh, investigated in more details in these two papers that were published recently. And um, our NUSOT conference in this year will 
take place online again. It's a free online conference in September. And you're welcome to attend the conference without charge and uh, to also submit late newspapers. If you have very exciting news that you want to publish, then you can go to this website and submit your paper uh, till the end of July. And our website also offers a number of uh, other links and informations. For instance, uh, when you click on the news or news, then you go to our Twitter account where I try to uh, uh, post new developments in our field, mainly papers uh, written by other authors uh, and, and published in, in some uh, key journals. So I try to update that almost every day. So there is uh, uh, always something new if you need new inspirations. And then there's also our new sort blog because um, not everything is ready for publication. Some things need some discussion even uh, between conferences. So that's why we started that new sort blog. So people can come up with issues, unsolved problems and, 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 and uh, start a a conversation about it. And here I show an example published some years ago uh, where I uh, summarize all the pitfalls that can happen in a computer simulation project. I think this is very important uh, to, to look at because there are many things that can go wrong in a simulation project and you should be aware of that when you start such a project. And last not least, I would like to close with a Quote from Albert Einstein, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. Thank you very much for your attention.